You guys asked for it. You guys are getting it. We're doing the deadlift tier list video. You guys love the bench press one. Now, before I get into rating all the exercises down here, there's two things I need to say. First off, if you're new here, welcome. Why should you listen to me? Well, I've achieved a 760 pound deadlift myself on kilo equipment, uh, competition equipment that is. I've also achieved a 722 pound deadlift at 198 pounds body weight. I've done even more at uh, the 220 pound class. So I'm a pretty good deadlifter myself, but don't just take my word for it or my abilities rather. You can look at all my clients as well. I have proficient sumo and conventional deadlifters literally all over the world. People pulling three times body weight and upwards. I have everyone from beginners to advanced athletes. So you can rest assured there's something to listen here into this video, but that brings me to my second point. This, the main thing I really want to get across is that my programming modality is going to be vastly different from another coach's programming modality. It's always going to be unique whenever you're creating a tier list to the coach's programming style. So there's not even really any, uh, I don't know, colloquial terminology or nomenclature I would use to describe my programming style either. Maybe about five to six years ago, I would have said I'm a sub max DUP kind of coach, but these days I couldn't be further from the, tr the truth. I utilize a lot of different programming styles. And because of that, you have to understand it's going to be extremely unique to me. And therefore these exercises, the way I rate them will be unique to me. So tier list videos are never a hard, you know, good versus bad. Oh, this exercise is way greater than this exercise or what this coach said over here is better than what this coach said over there. You have to listen to this in context, but we're going to try our best to rate this according to my programming style. So without further ado, let's dive into the actual video. Okay, guys. So I'm going to do my best to provide a ton of context. As I go through these, they are in no specific order. I'm going to be rating these as I go. So bear with me. There might take some time to think about this a little bit sometimes. And and I'm going to try to answer for both sumo and conventional, and I'm going to come up with an answer that fits in the middle while providing as much context to why, uh, whenever I do these. So let's start off with deficit deadlifts, and this is going to be from all heights. So, um, there's obviously like difference between a one inch deficit and a three to four inch deficit. There's going to be vastly different outcomes there. Generally, the bigger the deficit, the more it's going to train work capacity and core strength. And it's going to have less specific carryover, but more like weak point training. So I love uh, really large deficits, especially beltless, um, in a way that really works the core for conventional polars, especially. This is an amazing way to make your core incredibly strong. And you'll also to really learn how to grind through a sticking point. So deficit work for conventional polars is quite amazing. I would put this probably in, I think, A tier for conventional polars. And the problem is though, for sumo, that's not going to be the case. I almost never prescribe deficits for sumo polars. And if I do, it's going to be in a conventional stance. And that's mainly because I don't see a reason to change the mechanics of sumo, which is like, in my opinion, it's far more technical than a conventional. That doesn't mean it's easier uh, in the sense of technique. It's just, there's a lot of more working parts to a sumo. There's a lot of position you have to be very ultra careful about is where conventional if you get a little out of position you can usually finish the lift at least okay up until like you get really maximal so for you know sumo i would say i'd put this down in maybe d tier and so maybe we can do that maybe we can put these like this but the only problem is if someone fast forwards to the end they're not going to be able to see that so i'm going to meet in the middle and we're going to go B tier because I don't want someone fast forwarding and being like, why is there two deficit deadlifts in two different places? I'm going to try to meet in the middle, but understand that if I was doing this for conventional only or sumo only, which I'm just way too lazy to make two videos for the separate lifts, because a lot of the, the stuff I'm going to talk about here, a lot of the details uh, are going to get covered in both videos. So might as well just do one video. So deficit deads, I'm going to put them in B tier. Uh, next up, barbell hinges. This is without a doubt S tier. I don't even have to think about this. Everyone should hinge. And if, if you don't know, when I say barbell hinges, I'm referring to Romanian deadlifts. Got my legs stuck here. Give me a sec. Or stiff legged deads. So both of those achieve similar things. Um, and I'm really referring to barbell variants here, dumbbell RDLs and dumbbell stiff legged deads and stuff. Those start to get into other territories with either mobility or a little bit more hypertrophy dominant, but in relation to creating a better, stronger, you know, more jacked deadlifter, 
I'm going to go for barbell RDLs and barbell stiff-legged deads on a regular basis. Stiff-legged deads train the core like fucking crazy. Dan Green is the first person to ever introduce this to me, along with Jordan Shallows, really both of them when they're both training out of Boss Barbell. They really got me into this concept and this idea that Dan proposed that stiff-legged deads are amazing for training yourself in bad position, basically. So it's like if something does kick out of position when you're doing a max out attempt, which often does happen, the stiff-legged dead's kind of there to keep you trained in like shitty positions. And so you're just kind of strong no matter what. The more I experimented with this lift, I kind of started to change that, we'll call it theory or approach to the exercise. These days, I don't really look at stiff-legged deads as a means of training like shitty position or like making sure you can finish a lift in a shitty position. Rather, I look at stiff-legged deads as this is an amazing hamstring and glute builder while it really taxes your core to stay ultra tight. And I do them so fucking precisely. And I hound my clients over their technique that it almost actually makes them like impeccable posterior dominant specimens. It's like their low back is perfectly locked in. Their core is perfectly locked in their glutes and hamstrings get wrecked. Just an amazing exercise overall. Um, the RDL is kind of similar, but I would consider it slightly more biased towards like hypertrophy. So RDLs, of course, are going to give you a lot of strength. I've done them upwards of, you know, 495 plus pounds, but they're also to me an exercise done for just getting your hamstrings and glutes to be nasty. They're not going to be as core dominant because the stiff legged dead, especially I should mention, I love stiff legged deads off a deficit and I love them beltless. I actually rarely do them belted, although sometimes I will. And I almost always do them off a deficit because I find it trains the core more while still getting a ton of benefit to the posterior hamstring and glute muscles of the hips. And so, so there is a, you know, a little catch there that I really like them, you know, from a, a deficit and beltless as where the RDL is going to be belted. And you're going to actually oftentimes have more load on the bar because you're doing them in a way where the range of motion is a little shorter and you're not as compromised. I think about my all time best, the way I've done deficit uh, beltless stiff legged deads. I think I've moved like four Oh five for five, but I'm going off a three to four inch deficit and I'm doing them beltless. If I went heavier just from the ground and I had a belt on, I'm sure I would have much more than my RDL exercise would have on. So there's a lot of context there, but regardless of whatever you do S tier all the fucking way. Okay. This next one, the West side guys are going to get on me, man. Um, Accommodating resistance, bands and chains, D tier. Um, I never do this, never will. Um, I've tried in the past. I actually, a lot of my deadlift progress came from West Side uh, style training, like conjugation. But in truth, I don't think, I, I would have progressed my deadlift no matter what. Um, a lot of you know, the first time I ever deadlifted, I pulled 400 pounds. Now I had already been training for about a year uh, of lifting. But previously I had only tried deadlifting one other time. And the person who taught me had no idea what they were doing. And I hurt my back on like 185 pounds warming up. And I think I'd been in the gym for like a month or two. Like I hardly did deadlifts or excuse me. I hardly had lifted at that point by the time I was doing those deadlifts. So I just didn't touch deadlifts for like a year. When I went back to him, I literally was watching a video of Dan green in my house and I had a weight set downstairs and I saw him like fucking hitting these heavy deadlifts. And he's all jacked and juicy looking. I'm like, fuck, I need to go deadlift. And I pulled 400 pounds, just kind of teaching myself there on the spot. I was blown away by how heavy I could pull. So what I did was I just found a program that allowed me to basically max out all the time because I really wanted to get strong. And within a year's time, by my second year of lifting and only a year of deadlifting, I hit a 500 pound deadlift, which I think to add hundred pounds in even your first year, first two years of training is still really solid. And I did that through just basically like constantly maxing out and then having speed, AKA dynamic days. So on my dynamic days, I would use the bands. Uh, I didn't use chains very often because I didn't have access to them, but I did try them a few times. And just generally, I don't think they work the range of motion like people think. I don't think it helps your lockout. I think actually your lockout is almost always fixed with your position off the floor because the deadlift is only hard at the lockout for two reasons. Either one, it's just too heavy and it's slowing down up there like it should. And it's really probably slowing down in the mid range. Um, or two, you've lost back positioning because if you haven't lost back positioning, your glutes should be able to thrust through. If you watch my 760 and you watch all my best conventional pullers under me, you're going to see 
they don't stall at that lockout. Sumo's more or less the same too. It's actually, in fact, oftentimes even more an ascending strength curve. So with sumo, I would fucking use bands even less. Like this would be like F tier. Like I just, there's zero reason to overload your quote unquote lockout with, um, you know, accommodating resistance, whether it be reverse bands, normal band tension, doesn't matter. So accommodating resistance just in general, not a fan of, um, Again, though, like in different programming modalities, maybe it makes sense for some reason. But I think if I'm, I'm super transparent, I just think in general, it's rather useless. I think most of the like Louis Simmons really made this popular for guys lifting in gear, meaning multiply, you know, suits like I don't see how you couldn't get better effect in training by just doing a regular deadlift in a speed you know, repetition and intensity zone, or, um, you know, doing some other modality, some other weak point training. Uh, let's move on now. Trap bar deadlifts. God, this one's hard. I think I'm going to throw these. God, people are going to be mad at this one, but I think I'm gonna throw these in C tier. I know a lot of people say, Oh, these really help out with back fatigue. It helps me train my legs without getting my back. If that's you, you're programming wrong. You're it, it, the deadlift, most of the lifters under me can handle the most deadlift volume minus a few outliers. There's this big myth that deadlifting is more taxing than squatting. This is not true. I think the squat essentially squats demand you to have good technique because it's really egregiously obvious when you don't and you feel it and it moves like shit and you're weak. You can have pretty piss poor technique on a deadlift, but still heave around some big weights. This doesn't mean it's ideal technique. You'd lift more with better technique, but how many times have you guys seen some guy maxing out like six plates or some shit and he's just got a huge rounded back? Like, of course, if his lockout is taking four seconds long because his back position shit, he just like fucking grip and rips it off the floor and it's flying up. Like, of course that's going to tax his back. And he might be someone who's like, oh yeah, trap bars feel great on me. I think for most people, they're just not going to be ideal. Now, if I did use a trap bar, which I do use them and I do program them, I usually do them from the low handles and I oftentimes add a deficit and I oftentimes make them beltless. This helps train the core and legs even more. And there is some utility there, but truth be told, like it's kind of, to me, the jack of all trades, master of none, meaning like you don't get that great quad activation. You don't get that great glute activation. You don't get that great back activation, I would just do maybe lower volume, regular deadlifts or RDLs or stiff legs. Like there's a million other exercises I would choose instead of that. I will say it is a good tool for when your capacity is low. It's a great way to introduce a second deadlift day during the week to someone and then slowly get them out of it. But the goal is to get rid of the, the training wheels. They're almost like training wheels to me. Um, moving on to the next one, opposing stance, for conventional pullers. So you guys will see here later, I have opposing stance for sumo pullers. So opposing stance for conventional pullers, meaning, so if you pull conventional, do sumo deadlifts help you? That's what I'm saying here. So right now I'm talking about conventional pullers. Should they pull sumo as an accessory? We're going to go D tier. Now, if you're, this video is kind of in relation, I think a little bit to more towards like stronger deadlifters because it's deadlift assistance exercise. It's not like, deadlift assistance and posterior chain exercises. I will say sumo is actually amazing for training glute rotation and hip extension in a different way than the conventional. So I've heard some people propose this idea that sumo deadlifts have less demand on the hips because there's more demand on hip extension and conventional deadlift. That's technically true from like a very reduced idea of what a sumo deadlift is. Like if you're just looking at it in sagittal plane from side view, yes, the hips extend less than a conventional deadlift. Therefore, the conventional deadlift might have more hip extension demand. It might be a little better for hip extension overload, but, and meaning like training your glutes and hamstrings, but you're in a position where your knees are out to, towards the side and you're producing much more external torque. That's going to train your glutes in a very different way than conventional. If I have a female who wants to have a big fucking ass, or I have a guy who has incredibly inactive glutes, especially in their squat. Sumos can be amazing for that. Sumos can teach really stable hip position and squat. And I don't program this often because there's other tools to achieve this, but it is something you can use. And I'm not like, like if someone told me in the comments right now, like, Hey, I love doing sumo. And I'm a conventional guy. That's totally fine. Like might just be another way to get in some volume. So 
Maybe I should move this to C tier, but I'm not going to because I don't program it that way uh, and I don't do it, but I could see the utility for it. I could see someone having this in C or B. If it's higher than B though, they're tripping. And honestly, I think C is kind of the highest I would go. Okay, pause work, man. This one's hard. I almost want to throw this in S tier, but I'm going to put it in A tier. And the reason why is because as you advance, and ironically, a lot of advanced guys do pause work, I think this becomes a show-off lift. So I'm not naming names, but there's a lot of guys on fucking social media that are like, pause, deadlift. And you watch a video and you're like, where's the fucking pause? Like these guys are doing that for clout. If your pause is less than an entire second, it's a useless exercise. I don't care what anyone argues. I just, there's zero reason you should pause. Just do a normal deadlift. There's, there's no way that's going to be a litmus test for your back position. There's no way that's going to improve your form. There's no way that's even reducing load with a quick pause. I've tested this. I literally can pull 98.5% of my all out match with a quick pause. And this is because a quick pause, if you break the floor correctly, it's just not going to affect you that much. And this is even more true for sumo, which is a really short range of motion. So both for conventional and sumo at like a really high level, I just don't see the use of pause deadlifts. And most people abuse it as like a show off kind of exercise. But at an intermediate level, when you do this for like one to two second pauses, and I really prefer two, and sometimes I'll do this beltless. We're going to talk about that later. By the way, I have some specialty exercises not listed on here that we're going to bring in later, and I'm going to show you guys those. They're like my super secret exercises, and they fall into these categories, but I wanted to give them a special shout out, so we're going to get to that later. But pause work for beginners and intermediate deadlifters is one of my favorite variations. It, it would be like S tier for beginners, and like B to C tier for advanced guys, like probably even closer to C to D maybe. I don't know. I'd have to really think about it. But just I don't program it for advanced guys very much. I'd rather just do heavy belt lifts or just heavy deadlifts or fucking anything else besides pause work. And it's, it's just I don't see the point of pausing 700, especially if you have amazing form. But most people don't have amazing form. And the pause really showcases this to them. And it, here's the thing. If you actually do a two second pause, there's zero way you're going to have bad back position because you'll fucking feel like shit, dude. Your back will hurt. You'll be like, this does not feel good. Like you will fucking, you'll instantly feel like you can't pause for two seconds. And here's a crazy thing. I've done beltless pause work with 90% of my max for a single with a two second pause. You can go pretty fucking heavy still on them when you get good at them. But in the beginning, you're going to be heavy, heavily limited by your position. And it's really going to expose those weak points block pole. And this goes for any elevated deadlift. So when I say, um, block pole, I'm going to say anything where the, the lifter is elevating the load off the ground. So, you know, this could be a rack pole. This could be a block pole. Block poles are better than rack poles. Rack poles pull the slack out of the bar. So it is a harsh dead stop pull. As we're a block pole, there's still going to be some slack and that actually allows it to feel a little smoother and easier on the body. And it treats it more like a regular deadlift. Um, but generally anything elevated off the floor could be uh, mats you're using. Doesn't matter. Um, if I do do these, I program them and this isn't going in a tier necessarily. I'm just like leaving it here. I'm thinking about it. If I program these, I usually program these about three to five inches below the knee. I program them rather low. I don't go super high. I definitely don't do these at the knee or higher. I don't know why anyone would just do an RDL, just do a, a like regular down. Like why, why shorten the range of motion that much? Here's the thing with conventional, you're going to be tremendously weaker with most lifters at knee height. I know that sounds crazy, but it's unless you're using straps and ramping the weight like a, a strong man, like you get a lot of drive from the quads. I'm weaker on block poles than I am off the floor. It's a really weird dynamic because I just can't get leg drive. I'm sure if I like really fucking practice technique on these and maybe if the rules were a little looser in powerlifting, that might not be true once I like I spent months and months on these. But generally when you throw these into a mezzo on someone, because we're not trying to be the most proficient block bowlers, like I find with most of my conventional guys are literally weaker off an elevated um, pole. Um, isn't always the case. There are some guys you can just heave like tremendous weights off blocks um, for sumo. Uh, obviously they're going to lift more weights here. I wouldn't do these too often with sumo. If I did do them, it'd be for handling heavier weights and getting used to it. Um, I think I would put these in like C tier, honestly, like these just aren't super useful to me. I don't program them often. 
Uh, I will say for conventional, they can work the upper back really well. And I will do block bowls with a wide grip. That's actually a unique variation. I've, I've programmed, I'd say semi often through my training or my coaching career. Um, so that's why it's going to go in C and not D, but that's really the majority of it. I just don't do a lot of block bowls. You don't see the highest level deadlifters doing a lot of block bowls. Um, th there's the old like theory was like, start really high because it's easier and you can do a lot more weight and then go lower in the block pole and then go off the ground. That literally just doesn't work for most people uh, unless you're only com you know, comparing this to sumo pullers, but that, that just makes no sense to do that to me. Um, let's move on to the next one. Tempo or control to centric. So when I say tempo, this could be concentric, eccentric, any kind of tempo, um, pausing at the top and then controlling on the way down. That's one of my favorite, uh, ways to program this. I do a control to centric. I don't even put a time limit on it. I just say, Hey, control the negative and make sure the weight doesn't thud super loud on the ground. That's like basically how I instruct my lifters to do it. And then when they send their coaching footage in, I like review it. And if I hear this big fucking slam and I see their body losing tension, that's what I don't like. And, and these are amazing for, so here's the thing, dude. Um, I can never say his name. KK, the ultimate Russian deadlifter. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he, held a record for fucking ever. And I think someone just recently beat it. Um, but he basically pulled beltless conventional. The guy was super tall and just a monster, like just absolute monster. And he would talk about all the time that Americans especially would miss out on half the deadlift gains because they've never controlled their eccentrics. And I noticed a lot of the Russians would control their eccentrics. You saw him, Yuri, a lot of these guys doing this. I agree with this uh, sentiment and I actually love controlled eccentric deadlifts. A lot of people say they tax their back and they can if you go too slow. But if you just control it down, you get a lot more muscle building effects and you can build capacity to this. So obviously, if you've never done that before, it's going to cost you a little bit on recovery, but you can get used to these as you go on. So these are something I'm going to throw in B tier. I use these semi often enough to, I think, elicit like a B tier, but I definitely don't do these like into a heavy phase or anything like that. Okay. Posing stance for sumo puller is going to go S tier. It's something I always do. Um, it, it, if you pull sumo, I think you should have a strong conventional one because just no one wants to be that guy who can only pull heavy sumo. Like you don't want that row son, but also too, um, you're a strong back goes a long fucking way for sumo, especially as you get really fucking strong on sumo, even though you're very upright, your traps, your mid back, even your lumbar is going to work in a sumo. I promise you this having a turtle shell fucking thick ass back is going to go a long way for getting you to the advanced stage. I do not have a single sumo puller under me that doesn't do conventional work. So this again, this means sumo pullers is conventional. A good idea for them. Yes. S tier shit. It's, it's really simple. Tons of glutes and hams, tons of back, just fucking posterior dominant. There's only so much sumo practice you can do in a week before your hips get abused. This is where you're going to get in some more work and work on something that just can't be a weak point. Okay. What is this partials? Oh yeah. So these are partial deadlifts, dimmel deadlifts, range of motion change, you know, 1.5 deads, um, putting the deadlift um, like pausing the deadlift on the way down, like anything that's changing up the range of motion or like, you know, extending it to a 1.5. This is going to go in D tier. I see a lot of coaches using these this day. Stop. I, like teach a deadlift in the same court. Like, so, so it's weird because I get a lot of flack for being so non-specific sometimes. Like, I feel like modern powerlifting is like hyper specific and I just think it's not very good for programming, but um, and I, th I think the proof is kind of in the pudding with how many people get beat up and burn out of powerlifting. You didn't see this a couple decades ago. And these days, like you just like, I can name so many lifters that I know that come from my era that had a lot of potential that are perpetually injured because they're fucking trying to squat two, three times a week, every week, year round. Now, ironically, for whatever reason, this crowd has really like loved partial range of motions lately. I've seen a lot of dimmel deadlifts, a lot of, um, 1.5 deads and just, it makes no sense to me. Like, I don't know why you would program this. Um, I've tried in the past and just there's zero effect that I couldn't get from just doing a normal deadlift and coaching someone's technique that way. Or if I want to limit the load, I'm going to limit it by going beltless or by pausing or something else. That's not going to drastically change the like coordination pattern, like pulling a deadlift halfway up and then putting it back down. Would it, why just 
Just fucking practice your break on a normal deadlift. I, I don't understand that one. This one's kind of a rant. I think I'm just putting this in F tier. We're just going to leave this down here. <laughs> like, I just don't, I would not use this really in any fucking case. Uh, beltless work's going to go A tier. Um, I do this often, but not to the point where I'm like putting in an S tier. It's not like something I do with absolutely everyone all the time. This is definitely going to go A tier. Um, I like beltless work. I talked about this in my recent deadlift video. It's one of the best things that's helped out my deadlift, but I wouldn't say it's unanimous for sumo. It works, but not quite as much. And if I did do it, I'm going to go beltless conventional. I do a lot for sumo pullers. So I guess, yeah. So like I do do it with sumo, but not, I don't do like beltless sumo that often. I only do that in the off season. And the reason why is because the, the sumo is just not going to have that much of a change. Now I had a lot of people comment on that video. Like, Oh, I feel just as strong without a belt. You're using a belt wrong. You're bracing wrong. There are probably some people like, I'm not going to argue KK was doing it wrong. Who I was just talking about earlier is one of the greatest deadlifters of all time. He went beltless. I'm not going to try to pretend that like, if I had my hands on KK and was coaching him somehow back in the day, um, that I would have made him a better deadlifter and taught him to use the belt properly. I'm sure there's some people who are stronger somehow or as strong beltless, but I see way too many people making this claim. Guys, you, you're not that special of a snowflake. Like you're just using the belt wrong. You're not bracing correctly. And that's actually the number one thing I almost always fix on deadlifts um, is bracing. Like when clients come to me, they just never brace correctly. And that's how you use a belt to your advantage. I get a lot out of a belt. I get upwards of like three. And I was actually doing the math sometimes up to 4%, depending on how trained I am and whatnot out of a belt. That's a lot on a 700 pound pole. Okay. That's 28 pounds on a 700 plus pound pole. Um, wide grip work. Ooh, beats here. I use this a lot, but not super often. So wide grip work is really good for the upper back. This is something I do a lot for general hypertrophy and getting lifters to um, just basically like train the shit out of their traps, train the shit out of their uh, scapula position in the deadlift. I do this in two different ways. I either have them pack the shit out of their back and get into extension, almost like they're going to do a snatch and they're using close to a snatch grip width, but not quite snatch grip width, like a little narrower sometimes. And I'm just having them train extension and retraction dominance. Other times I'm letting their shoulders bleed forward and we're just going heavy. And again, it's just going to overload the shit out of their upper back. It's a great way for sumo pullers to remain tight and in position because they tend to have bleedy shoulders for conventional pullers. It keeps their T spine in good position. There's just a lot of benefit here. Um, real quick, I got to scroll. You guys are going to see the list disappear. Here's the four extra. So we're going to bang through these quick. These you'll see fall into these categories, but I wanted to include these in the video. So you guys are getting a little extra. So beltless three inch deficits. These are one of my favorite exercises for conventional pullers. Now for sumo, again, I'm never doing these, never doing these on sumo, but for specifically for you sumo guys, try beltless deadlifts on a three inch deficit but you're going to have to get fucking tight in your core and start light. And these feel easy at light weights and they get hard out of nowhere. Don't think you're Superman. You can fuck your shit up with these. I have a video I'm pulling on a deficit on three inch deficit, 683 pounds. And then I also did have a video where I'm doing it beltless with, I forget how much I had beltless. I want to say it was like 640 or some shit uh, for a max. Like you can go pretty heavy on those and they're fucking fun. Um, beltless pause work. S tier for sumo and uh, conventional when it's needed. I don't always need to do this. But there's a lot of people who have torso rigidity issues, both in sumo and conventional. And when that's the case, there's usually early intermediate lifters. I'm giving them beltless pause work for like one to two seconds, usually two seconds. And they usually do it like a second in like a half, but it's almost there. And I'm yelling at them to go longer. And they almost always don't, no matter how many times you tell them. But this is usually how I do it. And I'm going to do this for um, pretty heavy work. I'm going to go like singles to triples here because uh, it really allows them to practice that good tight core position. Decently high RPs too. Uh, two inch beltless deficit trap bar, low handle pull. So earlier you guys heard me hating on the trap bar. But when I do need to build work capacity and athleticism, basically just making someone more capable and having like more cardio on their deadlift, meaning like high reps don't fucking gas them or tire them out. This will be more like a B tier, even A tier. I'll put this in the middle here. This is a good one for very hyper specific situations. Now, again, generally, I don't program trap bar that often. But when I do need someone who's like super low capacity, 
they're kind of like dumb with their coordination. They're just like one of that geeky kid in school who like fucking couldn't do anything. That's okay. That was me too. Well, I was a geek, but I actually was highly coordinated. It was really weird. I had like a strange upbringing. I was like a nerd, but like not, if that makes sense. Uh, but for those of you who are nerds and just really weren't coordinated at a young age, this is a great way to like build capacity in the deadlift. And then wide grip RDLs. So specifically, remember, I put wide grip down here in B tier. These can be S tier again when I'm just hammering the fuck out of someone's posterior chain and upper back. Like these get both. Your traps will get annihilated. You'll have the juiciest traps ever. They'll be strong as fuck. Same thing with your hams and glutes. Great way to get in some secondary pulling work. I program these into the group coaching we have. Um, and if you're interested in group coaching, sign up down below. It's in the description box. I would program these guys all the fucking time. I need to get back to that. I want to add these back in next season. I think to the group coaching white grip RDLs are really fun. I might fuck around with those here soon. That's the tier list guys. 30 minute video. You guys got it. Catch y'all in the next one.